so we are at this these two negations what is meant by that is that one negates the other the materialist refuses to recognize the existence of what we may call as god divine creator some supreme being and the ascetic in his extreme flight equally refuses to recognize that there is a world and its realities sometimes quite harsh realities which impact upon our life he either explains them away or brushes them aside and our life hangs between the two like shorvinder says in that uh, short poem a tree beside the sandy river beach holding its topmost boughs to the skies like fingers to the heaven they cannot reach such is the soul of man his body and brain is our heavenly flight detain so on one side the roots we want both we are not satisfied either with most of humanity is not satisfied by either this extreme or that extreme <laughs> so so the materialist denies god but the good news is that god does not deny the materialist some time back in one of the school uh, talks with some class 12 students one girl after the talk was over suddenly raises the hand and tells me sir i have a question i said please she says i don't believe in god so i said no problem beta god believes in you so you don't have to worry about it <laughs> any which way you go into life you will end up because that is the last point but your seeking should be sincere so if the materialist sincerely seeks him through the matter he will pull him through that and meet him in the bosom of any elation <laughs> as the gita says as is your faith so he reveals himself to us and the paradox is that the materialist is denying what he eventually ends up discovering he denies there is an omniscient omnipotent reality called god so what does he seek to discover in matter the ultimate truth the omniscience the power by which he can know all things the omnipotence <laughs> it is a strange paradox because he says okay come come this way you want to come through the atoms fine because he is everywhere and that is why we see that in an age which extreme materialistic age god gave him uh, i mean he has given to man so much of knowledge and um, power which has come by digging into the into matter and uh, this chapter which we read yesterday closes with a kind of prophecy the whole book in a way ultimately it is a prophecy about the divine life but shubindo logically takes us so it says that well wireless telegraphy is a sign that time wireless telegraphy had come that man the science itself is beginning to discover greater ranges and powers of consciousness and this will continue till man will discover means by which all these wirings and lines will be reduced to a minimum except at the point of impulsion transmission and the point of receiving you call it mobile or whatever you want to call it all this he had foreseen so this is where man will reach but he also says because the true now there is a difference between the true material scientist and the scientific application applied science is a different field altogether somebody discovers and we want to apply it may be for real comfort of man or for uh, uh, you know sometimes for money that's a different matter but science which wants to discover reality and truth will end up after a certain point it will get a little glimpse and wonder what is lying there there is a very beautiful poem of sri aurobindo science and the unknowable where he says after digging into matter we will discover energy going further we will discover consciousness and then we will discover a being who is there but it's a long long process so that is the materialist who is denying god but god does not deny him rather he grants him you want this way i'll give you but it reaches a point where it has to make a leap it cannot make sense of this world reaching that point 
that point of nothingness where he says, I can't figure out if there is anything at all. Then he comes to this table and has a knock. He is knocked against the chair and the walls. He says, what is this reality? So this is the paradox of science. On the other hand, the next chapter is the refusal of the ascetic. So what is the approach of ascetic? Science wants to discover truth. It realizes at some point my senses are limited. So I am just uh, making the story from the other side. We say, oh, somebody discovered microscope. How did he discover? Something within prompts. Wait, wait. This is a way you can increase your senses. So microscope one discovers, telescope one discovers. And see, God is leading him through all that. And then he goes deeper and deeper and deeper. So he augments the senses, increases their bandwidth and begins to get data which is otherwise hidden from the limited human senses. What does the ascetic do? He follows a different trail. He says if there is uh, a creator, there has to be one source. There cannot be many sources and that one source must be everywhere. If it is everywhere, it must be within me. So he starts searching. So as he searches, here also divine helps him. Suddenly his senses undergo an enlargement. This is what is known as supra-physical senses. So through these supra-physical senses, one begins to see, hear, feel, sense the first touches of something which is beyond the material world frame. One feels helped. One feels an assistance. And one proceeds, same way. But one has to be meticulous, as we have read, not start, you know, uh, scientist doesn't go immediately gaga over every uh, thing he discovers. One has to keep on going deeper and deeper within through the subjective spaces. So these are the two approaches to discover things objectively, what looks like things and objects and subjectively by entering into our own psychological apparatus where by subjectivity means who am I, what is inside me, love. Now love can express objectively but may not, knowledge. It can express itself through words and writings, it may not, it may be held back. Power, will, faith, most of the beautiful things, joy, they are in our subjective world. You can't measure them. What you can measure is objective and what you cannot measure is subjective because they are happening in some inner space which we don't understand. So he entered into those spaces, the ascetic, and what he discovered? He discovered that normally we are shut in a box but this box has certain holes here and there we don't look into that hole why because through the senses we are all the time as plato described we are glued to see only that like the child watching television screen and mama is there papa is there everybody is there but the child is not he doesn't register why because he's busy watching the that's our state even with the divine. We are so busy with these senses. That's how it is described that the do through the doors of the senses, there are nine which are outside and only one goes inside. But sometimes the scenes are so daravna, so terrible, that we just close our eyes and say, let's search something or someone who is out here. So this is how at one point he draws us inside. Of course, this is not the best of ways where there are others who want to seek beyond the limited frame. And the mother says, if you believe what you see, what you hear is true, then you are not really ready for the spiritual life. Very clearly, it's in fact a last conversation in, uh, in the playground where he says that if you really believe what you are seeing, what you are hearing is true, what you are tasting, smelling, then you can't enter. You have to understand that this is a frame. So Shabindo says, worlds are frames. Just imagine, not just material world, they are frames for that to express himself. Like a book is simply an expression, but does the entire personality of the author exhaust itself in a book? No. Many books he can write and still, if you ask your window, sir, you have written 35 volumes, so much you have written, he would say, what I have held back is much, much more. Someone was asking, why did Shobindo revise the life divine. Very simple, 1914 to 1919. 
he had to handle the entire thing <laughs> he says that we started the arya and then because of the war mother had to leave and suddenly the whole thing fell upon him that's how he says and so he said well a yogi can do everything including writing philosophy so he took up the arya 64 pages and he is all doing it all by himself managing the account everything so he he was we can say that like in a hurry i must give at least some fundamental truths building blocks but then after the mother comes he takes over the ashram then 31 onwards he said now i must write properly and then the second world war certain things come up hitler and gandhi and these people with tremendous vital personalities holding great influence over human beings that's what he said it was one of the signs that the super mind is near men will arise who will have great vital influence not intellectual influence or spiritual influence vital influence and so these people had a reason mussolini stalin they are all same kind with variations shades and therefore new data had come flowed into the ken science science was discovering new things so he adds changes writes new thing because he wants to give to all of us the best reconciliation he doesn't want that people should later say that when shurabindo wrote it molecular genetics was not discovered so he anticipates these all thing because philosophy has to reconcile all that has been discovered known experience that's what shobindo's philosophy if we want to use it or metaphysics is it doesn't discard or deny anything even the most casual experiences all of them he brings together and makes a beautiful bouquet so ascetic started enlarging his consciousness and out of the individual he discovered into the the cosmic consciousness so what is the cosmic consciousness very simple we have this a uh, physical body and physical senses through which we sense physical objects but neither material material existence ceases with our body or with these objects we see it is spread through space what is it that is weaving all these stars and atoms and galaxies together virat that we can say is the physical consciousness the material consciousness so if we disengage from this physical body and its occupations then through the individual consciousness it can start spreading and entering into the cosmic consciousness shobindo describes this experience very beautifully in a poem there are two three poems cosmic consciousness cosmic spirit where he says i am the life of the village and the continent i feel its every stab and kiss he described this experience that somebody is coming and his anger is entering into him he you knows someone is coming and he is very angry whatever he may do in front is a different story but his anger enters into his skin it's all described in savitri why because then we are no more limited to this little formation that's why in yoga each one becomes a representative of humanity apart from our own individual problem which are not easy <laughs> you have to take upon the burden of many others 50 people doing this yoga are taking the problem of 500 5000 god knows how many he is a representative person so why because in the corresponding state of consciousness we are extended the yogin begins to open he can't help it same thing because his ego shell begins to break and it can be very disorienting very unnerving that's why he repeatedly depending on the mother turning to her surrender all this comes later similarly in the vital consciousness we are aware only of a little bit of life energy imagine when we extend into the world of life we'll start experiencing life beyond death we'll start experiencing that the departed has not departed and we won't know whether to weep with others or to be happy because there is no death you experience that life which is gone beyond you experience the life of the gods the titans all this life in this entire creation then the sun the moon the stars are no more inanimate you pray to the sun you know that there is a deity behind the sun so when you offer the water you don't have to give scientific explanation 
in consciousness they are all connected you have this faith that you are giving it to the divine manifest as that sun and this water will reach that divine who is behind this creation why because in consciousness everything is connected so this is the second at vital and there are many in in our use, normal life we experience these things very often sometime when somebody is about to come uh, something tells us maybe so and so is going to come sometimes a thought enters us i was as i was sharing just 3 days back i was saying i wish there was a movie made i had an idea of a movie most perfect movie that can be made on shurbindo with all the details and sense and the next day in my mailbox there is a movie which is according to me it's it's the movie one single movie 2 hours 28 minute but made with tasalli and love and care to details and a sense i think i put it on the recording group so this is how there is we begin to get connected with things which are uh, not immediately there within the range of our indriya senses but are still there in the cosmic ideas begin to enter into people's head you see how buddha here and loud say there and they are son they are not speaking different things the dao of loud say is same as par brahman he doesn't use the same language he uses a different language but if you read through it you realize this is yoga of the upanishads he is giving an upanishad how beautifully in his own context so you see the similar idea socrates in a different context same truth he is receiving in the world of ideas again there is a extension cosmic consciousness then the ascetic does something else also he says okay but who is witnessing all this cosmic consciousness i am the witness as an ego or a mental ego i am witnessing myself or i can go still deeper but who is the witness because he is experiencing all these things who is the one who is experiencing then he goes beyond these frames into what transcends and what transcends transcends he says my god all this cosmos vanishes it transcends that's how swami vivekananda experienced when he asked shri ramakrishna and shri ramakrishna touched his he said is there god he said okay wait now he was ready so he touched his heart suddenly he saw the entire world shimmering and shaking and vanishing and he didn't know what is it it was frightening experience and there was another when he he said okay this is very good i must arrive here so he started meditating and one day he experienced only his head all the rest he couldn't so he was very i mean his strong courage but still he was unnerved what has happened and then when he comes back somehow and goes to shri ramakrishna ambil he says khub bhalo you want to go there i have locked the doors and given the key with the divine mother <laughs> when you have finished the work she will give it to you you won't get it before that so you see there are mysteries which are far beyond the limitations of the senses and that the ascetic explores and eventually he explores again discovered that nothingness what is why is it called nothing just as the material scientist explores and finds nothingness but he knows something is out there where did this force emerge from but he can't figure out he can't lay his hands microscope telescope doesn't reach there his calculations fail there and similarly the yogin when he enters into the transcendence and this world of names and forms vanishes he doesn't know what to call that even if he uses he may say oh it's a deep peace what is it if you ask him he'll say can't say can't name what does it look like forms figures everything vanishes so what is that so he says there is nothing with which i can describe that is the nothingness in which everything is there as a potential so these are the two extremes i have already touched upon most of now the ascetic refusal of the ascetic now we'll read some lines and there is a very very powerful line after the materialist denial the refusal of the ascetic starts with okay first we'll read the mandukya upanishad 
and there is a beautiful line here Manduk Upanishad is about the uh, Om so the Chatushpad Brahman it's one wonderful the way creation starts so there is one this whole existence waking consciousness through which we experience is called as Jagrat Avastha and Virat this Virat that's how he is described then behind the Virat Swapna Avastha and that is Hiranyamaya or Taijasa and then beyond it beyond the Hiranyagarbha uh, there is Hiranyagarbha there is Garbha that you know golden boom of thing there is the Pragya it transcends and beyond Pragya is Turiya so Chatushpath creation starts from Turiya we cannot talk anything about it it enters into Pragya where the seeds of creation are, are held it's unmanifest but they are there as seeds from there they are released into Hiranyagar so now the womb receives certain seeds for one kalpa and then from there they enter into the manifest outwardly manifest Virat the Hiranyagar is also manifestation but at different levels and this is the physical manifestation that's how it starts so Shubindu starts with this all this is the Brahman this self is the Brahman and the self is fourfold so this is the fourfold self beyond relation featureless unthinkable in which all is still that's all and then this wonderful line I feel this is a line we must hold like a mantra always in our heart and still there is a beyond probably the shortest sentence Shubhinda has used in the life divine and still there is a beyond after we have discovered everything materially we have touched all that matter can give us then we will wonder and still there is a beyond and that beyond is beyond this material existence life beyond life mind and super mind and he goes describing that and um, page 21 there is a very interesting uh, I just love Shurabindu is a perfect gentleman and he would rarely use a word which is even seemingly a little harsh <laughs> here we will see what he says this vulgar or rustic error that's all beyond it <laughs> this vulgar or rustic error of our corporeal organs physical senses does not gain in validity by being promoted into the domain of philosophical reasoning obviously their pretension is unfounded obviously anybody knows that what I see with the eyes is very limited bandwidth even physically because it's very small spectrum what I hear dogs can hear better cats can hear better same with my sight it's so limited so he says obviously it is unfounded so this reliance on senses first thing we learn in science and spirituality is the same thing do not trust appearances the mother when she speaks about psychic discoveries she says first thing you have to learn is that the mind cannot understand spiritual things and all our judiciary is all about senses kya hua tha kya kiya tha andar mein kya bhav tha what was going on inside intent the background the past that we, we can read in Sri The Phantom Hour, such a wonderful story. So we cannot understand this surfaces of life. And all our science is ultimately a science of appearances, which he'll tell us later. So the ascetic understands it. And therefore, next paragraph on page 21. Not only are there physical realities which are supra-sensible, but if evidence and experience are at all a test of truth there are also senses which are supra physical so if you tell a yogi that where is God he will say I have seen him you have seen him but I have not seen him there that's your problem <laughs> I have to go by my evidence not your evidence if experience and seeing is an evidence then there are other kinds of senses and even in the physical domain, the mother speaks about 12 senses. They are still asleep. 
for instance the ability to weigh something accurately and the mother speaks about it when you put hands you should be able to just get the right number of amount of grain and she had several time demonstrated even there are senses which can awaken once somebody asked the mother mother can you look behind because she knew what was going on she said yes i have eyes behind my back also and shurbindo actually confirmed it she can see behind what is going on so there are many sense and these are within human can see blind people when they are blind there was a program also quite a validated program they can learn to read and read with quite a fair degree of accuracy blindfolded other tactile senses can take the place of vision so there are so many possibilities which we don't know so the ascetic explores them and therefore the yogin enters into greater ranges of experiences page 22 but the truth of great ranges of experiences experience whose objects exist in a more subtle substance and are perceived by more subtle instruments than those of gross physical matter claims in the end the same validity as the truth of the material universe and this what is going to multiply more and more already that's why people now how did uh, this came up that there is life after death because this experience of near death experience started multiplying initially people tried to explain it away oh, because of chloroform because of this that but people started recording documenting so they started documenting they found that there is a similarity of experience some of them are very fascinating invariably there is a something called as light there is a tunnel then a light comes and then when they enter into the light there is a very funny experience also someone reaches that being and those who are uh, worshipers of krishna will see their krishna those who believe in christ will see their christ and someone asked that being which religion this i have uh, written in that book uh, death dying and beyond is documented from an actual excerpt that which religion you prefer sir so the reply was frankly i don't care this is the reply he received got transmitted frankly i don't care see indians knew that long back so they said karma not believe it doesn't matter which religion you belong to your karma is important you may belong to any religion or don't believe in any religion but karma should be aligned with dharma most secular way of looking at life he says i don't care i have another criteria <laughs> another way of looking at things there was uh, i i believe i mean people here who have how these senses developed i am told that chandradeep ji because he had to take the letters he would when letters were there he would know which letter has to go where and he would just immediately segregate it so there are many things which we don't know which ascetic explores but he does not stop there he keeps moving to the ultimate reality like the material scientist and then he says something about the material scientist and his conclusion page 23 if we push the materialist conclusion far enough we arrive at an insignificance and unreality in the life of the individual and the race which leaves us logically the option between either a feverish effort of the individual to snatch what he may from a transient existence to live his life jisko bolte na jee le apni zindagi original shurbind has written in the life divine but this is if you believe material reality is the only reality then you will say zindagi na milegi dobara we don't believe in that ha huh? we get life many lives <laughs> because we believe in evolution we don't believe in one life enjoy what you may that but that's the conclusion if material reality is the only reality that's the logical conclusion 
as it is said or a dispassionate and objectless service of the race and the individual knowing well that the latter is a transient fiction of the nervous mentality and the former only a little more long lived collective form of the same regular nervous spasm of matter all this is a very subtle humor and we can really laugh with it which you are been though that what is the basis of good that one has to do if you are you really don't believe in anything beyond material life there is no basis you may still do it because you are bound by your so called goodness but you will know that it's meaningless the doer of the good is a fiction and that for which you are doing good is also a fiction everything is transient atoms floating in space few lines below materialism like spiritual monism arrives at a maya that is and yet is not so we see that things exist but if you go deep inside they are not that's what material science is already reached how this is solid if you look into the atom nothing is solid some mass is there but look at it electrical charges buttressing together in a cloud now this is the latest we are explaining all around with empty space and it gives the senses this impression not only this impression actually you can't say this is atom go by my side you can cannot do that it hits us hard so this is the paradox of materialism so therefore he says if we have to enlarge the consciousness to cosmic consciousness we have to do it inwardly it cannot be because senses have a limit and then he says that when the ascetic goes to an extreme through many linking stages he will reach that same point this is a table that is a universe but both are frames there is the percipient who is perceiving this table there is the percipient who is perceiving the galaxy that's how it is described like an eye extended in heaven so one can reach that point where one is perceiving the wheeling of the stars shobindo speaks of this experience several places one place he says i have wrapped the wide world in my wider self london and tokyo and paris my spirit seeing are Uh, well that is cosmic man the first is cosmic consciousness now that was the original meaning of the word digambar i have wrapped the wide world in my wider self what is that wider self all around this akash dik dishai dig digant akash in that i have wrapped the world so somebody who could arrive at that cosmic consciousness became digambar and see how it gets distorted throw off all your clothes and do a fashion parade on the road so you are a muni no sir you have to arrive at that state of consciousness at which that great one of the great yogis mahavir he is really the name is so appropriate how he has reached that point where he must have felt that it doesn't matter what are you wearing if somebody asked him i'm wearing the sky as rope that's an experience of cosmic consciousness the mother speaks about it chubhendra speaks about savitri's experience in in uh, uh, in savitri that is the mother's experience in savitri he says you reach a point where when you experience arcturus and belphegor burn in a corner of your boundless self this is going beyond anything the constellations are within you the mother also described this experience because when the limits of the ego are gone where is the limit it can extend the whole universe begins to be experienced inside arcturus and belphegor are constellation of stars so beyond we i mean it's something amazing and she speaks about that in fact at one place the mother describes her cosmic body and then she says naturally disciples want to know where is the ashram she says it's somewhere here she points toward the <laughs> from the navel to this area it is there but it's a special formation she says it is in that uh, protective bluish violet light she describes like that 
people have had this experience of shirobindo as the vishu virat now these are other order of realities which at some point humanity will gain it when it you know moves in that direction so who is writing this book we can glimpse from that that you know someone who had i have wrapped the wide world in my wider self and everything he says uh, man's uh, man's million joys and his countless sorrows take place within my single heart i am the bird he saves the beast he slays that is what one becomes in that stage <clears throat> and therefore he says that just as there is a reality of the materialist the person who lives in the cosmic consciousness that is real to that person so when shri krishna says that you know i was the one who took upon me all the sufferings people say it's a metaphor it's not a metaphor it's a real experience shri krishna can have and all of us can have if we pursue that path where sitting on that chariot he was absorbing all the poison of the world within himself he was playing the role of hari har he had become shiva absorbing the poison as well as the flute player waiting in the background so this is how we see that uh, there is a possibility of the cosmic consciousness and then he says that who is perceiving so you will go to the cosmic being what we call as god but god is still further the cosmic being the vishva virat what is uh, vishva roop you have the cosmic being who is enjoying this entire universe everything is coming out of him going into him when shirobindo was asked by niruddha sir you too must be having a vishrup like shri krishna he says yes but it is not that frightening with danta karani yodha all of them are in the stuck in this jaws because that was a war condition so he came as time the time spirit but my vishrup is gentler <laughs> sweeter because now but possibly during the second world war if somebody had a glimpse one would have seen this so and then we where what do we discover page 26 world lives by that that does not live by the world so now the question comes the ascetics say that when you reach that state all this nature world uh, material life all this drops away and actually you see how insignificant it can become just like to the materialist in extreme what is the significance of earth what is happening here pralaya 100 pralayas may take place it doesn't matter he says no it is not like that and then then he will describe it in detail in the next chapter we'll, we'll hold on for that but he says that ultimately you reach that transcendent being and beyond the being non being and then he describes a little bit we need not go into it detail so people say out of non being being immersed non being means you can't describe anything about him or it or that or he or she caught by the wrong end by our materialist you can't <laughs> say he she it that it's okay but equally you can say he she it that it depends on your choice don't take away my choice but nevertheless nothing can be said about that so it is non being and then they say out of non being being immersed so sri arvind asks humorously at what point of time because there was no time at that point of time <laughs> time and space have not come so how do you say out of non being being immersed both are two sides of one reality and this is very easy to understand there is in us an impersonality you know i have seen somebody in deep meditation and you know this child comes and disturbs so called you no know, meditation cannot be disturbed and then you are looking with blank eyes not trying to understand what is this <laughs> then after some time you come back oh okay what do you want because the impersonal and the personal the being and the non being they exist together all of us have a very impersonal side we have not discovered it and all of us can equally relate personally in a thousand ways so they are together so he says non being even when we discover it is not inconsistent with action in the world and he gives a wonderful example of none else but buddha himself 
He says, people have made him appear that nirvana is inconsistent with the world. But look at Buddha in nirvana and look at his action, one of the mightiest action if ever there is of somebody who has, you know, is Buddha's world over. Look how people have turned to Buddha. Buddha is in a state of stillness. Silence and words, speech, they are not incompatible with each other. So that's where he says that and it is uh, very beautiful. So he says, but Buddhism disturbed the balance of the world. Initially, Indians knew this, but um, this balance had been disturbed by Buddhism. Whereas as far as Buddha is concerned, he had reconciled within himself these two. Again he will speak in the next chapter and last we will read this passage on page 27, very powerful. We seek indeed a larger and completer reformation. We want to join these two poles, from the infinitesimal to the infinite. From what is below the infinitesimal and from with that which is beyond what we can even conceive the infinite but we cannot say anything. So people often ask this question that um, how was God born? He says this question is, question is invalid. Because the moment you say born, you will have to say, how did, was that born from which God was born? So you will end up with the infinite. There is no other answer. You have to say that there is the infinite consciousness, infinite being. So there is no end to it. We have these words, aparampar. And everything is happening in him. So we cannot even say that the world was born at this point of time on the seventh day or tenth day. It's a perpetual movement that uh, I'm jumping on to the next chapter. So, so we hold here, but we, let's read this powerful. We seek indeed a larger and completer affirmation. Not the affirmation of the ascetic that yes, there is that which is nothingness. He says that's not complete because you have not reconciled it with material life. We perceive that in the Indian ascetic ideal, the great Vedantic formula, one without a second, ekamevadvityam, has not been read sufficiently in the light of that other formula equally imperative. All this is the Brahman, Sarv Khal Vidam Brahman. Both, one is ekamevadvityam, there is one without a second. Second, all this is the Brahman, Sarva Khalvidam Brahman. That's why there are these two complementary truths. One is Neti Neti. Neti Neti is, you can't describe, define. Neti Neti Jako Shruti Gave. But then comes, So Nandalal Pakad Maya Ki Ungli Pakad Chalana Sikhave. It's a paradox. He says that what is this paradox that is confronting me? Brahma, Anadi, Anand, Agochar, Neti, Neti, Jako, Shruti, Kame. He says, I am seeing this paradox. What is he seeing? He says, on one side I can see this baby Krishna is none else but Brahma, Anand, Anad, Agochar. At the same time I see him become this. See, there are mystics who had this experience. One of them is Kabir. When he says, when he was asked about, if somebody asked Kabir, Aapka Ram ke baare mein kya kehna hai? What do you have to say about Ram? What would Kabir say? He said this, but people have taken it in a divided sense. Ek Ram Dasarath ka beta. Ek Ram hai Jagat Pasara. Ek Ram Ghat Ghat ka vasi. Ek Ram hai Sabse Nyara. So people take it say, oh, Dasarath ka beta is just for the sake. But Asal Ram, no, they are all one reality. The Rama is the avatar. And the Rama who is Vishwavirat, and the Rama who is imminent in the entire creation in Ghat Ghat, and the Rama who transcends Sabse Nyara, all of them are one single reality. That's how the mystics have experienced. So, this is the, he says, one without a second, Neti Neti must be read along with Sarva Khalvidam Brahman, Iti Iti. This too, this too. Where is Brahman? This is Brahman, yes. What about this? This too is Brahman. What about that? That too is Brahman. That's why it is said in one of the stories with which we will close that when um, someone 
asked, a king asked, he had this uh, penchant to ask people, tell me Allah, who is greater, me or God? He had a standard answer which he wanted. And uh, people knew if I say God is greater, then we had it. So one child says, indeed you are greater king. Ah, good, sensible boy. Can you please explain to them, these people are remaining quiet? Because you can do something which God cannot do. Yes, I know. You are brilliant. But can you tell how? I want them to know. I know it. He says, see, if you are angry, you can throw somebody out of your kingdom. God can't do that because his kingdom extends everywhere. He can't do it. You can do it. He cannot do it because he is everywhere and in all things. With that we will enter into the next chapter which is precisely this reality omnipresent. So we will take a break for 10 minutes and continue.